Um, and we are going to be talking about chapter two, verses one through 13. And the title for today's message is status signaling and virtue signaling. It's all favoritism and it's all bad. And so you'll understand what that means and how it applies to James chapter two in just a moment. Um, and hopefully you will pick up some wisdom from James uh, that will enrich you, bear fruit in your life, and hopefully challenge you to see uh, these verses in bigger and better ways. All right, so let me start by reading James 2, 1 through 13. My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and, a, and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated amongst yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said you shall not commit adultery also said you shall not commit murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Let's pray. Lord, we're grateful for this time this morning and for this the words and these scriptures that we're studying today. We pray, Lord, that you'll give us understanding and that you'll encourage us to be bold and courageous and to walk in the things that we learn. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so this passage has a lot in it. And as I'm sure you know, we won't get to every bit of wisdom that we could pull out of it. We would spend the next year trying to do that because every, every passage in especially uh, scriptures of wisdom or um, passages that impart wisdom, uh, like James, Proverbs, etc., are so rich and so deep and have so many almost infinite applications, not infinite interpretations, but infinite applications in our lives that we could really, I mean, you could spend a lifetime digging into just one or two of them. So our goal is always to pull out the general point so we know the main idea that the author is communicating to its audience, to his audience, and to find a couple of pieces of practical application that we can implement today so that we don't just hear this and file it away and not think about it again, but to then go into the week offering what we've learned up to the Lord so that he can stir up specific application points to your life. I can give you general ideas, but how it applies to where you are right now and what God wants you to be focusing on and thinking about is not something I can tell you on a Sunday morning. I can maybe throw out something that happens to hit the spot for some of you, but for every one of us, there is a message for you from the Lord, but you have to get that from him. So I'm hoping that I plant a seed that the Holy Spirit will nurture and cause to grow in your life. And that's what I want to, as always, uh, touch on today. So first, let's look at the big picture. Let's see what's the main sort of obvious idea, maybe 
maybe obvious, maybe not so obvious, that this passage is showing us. Well, there are four main things that this passage is telling us, even if you read it one time. And so if we were to do a reading comprehension uh, quiz with this group and we were to read this passage out loud and then we were saying, now list the main idea of the passage or the main ideas, we would come up with one or all of at least the things on this list. So obvious, don't show favoritism, okay? Don't show favoritism to people, especially who look glamorous or who are rich. What we might consider the, the glitterati or the celebrities or the sort of who's who in today's society, today's world, we want to not treat them better than we treat the person who isn't so fancy looking who doesn't have all the nice things, who doesn't present very nicely. And we might take that a, a level deeper and say something like, it's not just about showing favoritism to rich people, but it's also about not showing favoritism to people who have the appearance of being maybe what we envy or what we esteem or what we um, seem to value in society, whether that's celebrity or popularity or money or whatever we want to put into that category. We might also say that it, there's a special uh, admonition or special instruction to take care of the poor because there's some conversation about the rich tend to be the ones who persecute, at least for this audience that, this, that James was talking to and we'll come back to that. And yet it's the poor of the world so the people who are looked down upon by society that God has chosen to make rich in faith. And it's those that we are supposed to look to because God has selected them. He's turned things upside down. He tends to take those who people dismiss and turn them into something great. Now, that doesn't mean that he can't take people who the world thinks are great and have them use that status and platform for something great. In fact, that goes along with stewardship. People who have a lot are responsible for doing good things, great things with all that they've been given. To whom much has been given, much is also required. All right, so nobody's off the hook. But those we tend to overlook, those who don't have much, those who can't contribute much, those who can never return the favor, we're supposed to not forget them, not neglect them um, or overlook them, but to take care of them. We also will probably spot the theme that we're supposed to keep the law. This is something we see throughout scriptures that we are supposed to obey the commands of God as they are given in scripture. But then you have to remember also that keeping the law is an impossibility and this passage goes into some detail about how even if you keep most of it and you break one part of it you're breaking the whole thing and therefore don't ever think that you're capable of being perfect and you for that reason like everyone else need mercy and because we need mercy we know that we should be merciful to others okay those are the big picture principles and we would do well if we could just take those, go pray about them and apply them to our lives to the best of our ability, moment by moment, as the Holy Spirit brings about situations that are relevant to these principles. But I, of course, don't wanna stop there. I wanna take a bit of a deeper look. I wanna go into some of these same main, ob relatively obvious points. And I wanna pull out more of what's happening here that maybe you've not thought of, or maybe you have thought about it, but not in a long time, or maybe you haven't thought about it as it applies more specifically to today and to your life. So first of all, let's take a look at how this whole thing starts. Don't show favoritism. And then it goes into a little story, something like a parable that says, what if a guy walked into your meeting and he looked really fancy at gold jewelry and you could tell he had high status, and would you not go make sure that he has a VIP seat? And then another guy walks in who looks pretty frumpy and you have him sit in the back or ignore him completely or tell him to sit at your feet. 
sort of near your footstool in other, um, in other translations of this passage. What's wrong with favoritism? I remember not, I, I, I went to, um, gosh, I can't even remember the last time it was that I went to a church conference. It, I mean, it was obviously before COVID and then sometime before that. Um, but I've always, I've always felt a little uncomfortable with how, even when I go to these, I go to these church conferences and the first like 10 rows are reserved. So it doesn't matter how early you get there. It doesn't matter. And I've gone to these conferences with my kids. So I've got, you know, now I have an eight-year-old and a four-year-old, but the last time I went to a conference, there were probably six or seven and two or three. And we are ma managing kids and I'm still trying to get to these things early so that I can get a decent seat so I can check my kids into the children's program um, so I can be near a door, but also near, you know, the, the, the screen or the, the action and whatnot near my friends, et cetera. And usually there's, you know, sometimes 10 or 15 of us that are sort of connecting with each other and saving seats and whatnot. And all that to say, it's a whole production to get there and to get a good seat, to be able to see, but to also be able to tend to your kids if you need to. And then there's a whole section that's like perfect seating and you can never sit there. It's reserved not just for the person who's speaking at that particular event, but it's reserved for the person who's speaking in every other VIP in the district or in the denomination. Now I understand why they do it, right? You don't want those people to have to show up 45 minutes early to be able to sit somewhere. Perhaps you want them to be able to be close to the stage so that they can um, get on stage quickly when it's their time to speak. But let's be honest, what's really going on there isn't just convenience. It's a way of honoring the person that you want to sit close to the stage. It's a way of giving them a VIP section that the rest of us don't get. And I wonder what you think about, I mean, don't answer now, but I wonder what you think about that. To me, that's, I get why it's done, but it also makes me a little bit uncomfortable. And I know a guy who used to have one of those VIP reserve spots and he would never sit in it. He would always sit with his family or with his church that would come along for that reason. What's wrong with giving somebody the VIP spot who has high status or who's wealthy or who looks fancy to us or who we want to establish as our buddy or our pal or our connection or ingratiate ourselves to that person. What's wrong with that? Isn't there some element of just like natural interaction where people want to do that thing. I mean, even when you invite guests over to your home, you make things nice, you roll out the red carpet, you might even give them the head of the table or let them serve themselves first or whatever the case may be. Well, I'm gonna tell you a couple things that are that's wrong with favoritism and why this passage, which is a pas passage on wisdom, tells the church in particular not to be that way. So the first thing is, Favoritism plays into the world's paradigm. We don't put people in the VIP, according to this scripture, and, in, and according to just practical understanding how we've all seen it play out, based on those who are the most submitted and humble to the Lord. We don't have any kind of measure to, te to test who's rich in faith, and those are the people that get to sit up front. No, it's all based on status. It is a way of signaling status or importance that we play favorites. Now, this passage is talking about favoritism as people come to your meeting, right? As your time together as believers, so especially in the church. But we might take this into any area of our lives in terms of favoritism. How do we play favorites? Within the context of what this scripture is talking about, we play favorites based on status. And we pick the status not by kingdom principles or measures most the vast majority of the time. We pick the status based on worldly paradigms, understanding, ways of points of view, ways of seeing the world. 
And the scripture, in case it wasn't clear, talks about the wealth and the gold jewelry and the looking fancy and all that stuff. So who looks like someone who's important? And that's the person we want to put in our best seats. Well, aside from playing according to the world's paradigms or playing into that, it also shows our own insecurities. Why do we want to sit next to someone who's important or who looks important, who plays the role? Well, because we like to be associated with important people. Everybody wants a VIP card, everybody, right? You go to Disney and they sell you a front of the line pass or a VIP pass, which means you get to go in front of everyone else and you get to get on the ride first. Well, that does two things. One, it helps you skip the line, which is great. But two, it also shows everybody who's waiting. <laughs> look at these, look at these schmucks, right? These losers. I get to go in front of all of them. Now I'm guilty of doing it. If I when I go to an amusement park, if they have a front of the line pass for sale, I buy it. If I can afford it, I'll take it because lines at amusement parks are torture. But there's something funny about when people sort of parade up to the front as everyone look and see how important and how wealthy and how much better than you I am. And it's one thing to do it in an amusement park. It's quite another thing in a whole different universe to do it at church. And this passage is saying, the world has a way of looking at things but the church should always be looking at things through the lens of the kingdom, through the lens of the gospel, through God's lens, God's way of seeing the world. And that does not play in to status and appearances. And it doesn't tell us to worry about who we want to be seen associating with. It tells us to be humble and not worry about what other people think of us. And the reason we want to sit next to and be associated with those who are of high status and put them at the front of our church or at the front of our meeting is because we want everyone to see how important we are because we know all these other important and fancy people. And the last thing I'll highlight is it tends to benefit those who persecute the church. Favoritism tends to benefit those who persecute the church. In this passage, it talks about the rich, the wealthy, the well-to-do. Now, that was especially important to the audience of this passage of this book because it was the wealthy, the high society, who looked at this crazy person, Jesus, and all of these disciples and tried to stop them. They were the ones who said that Jesus and all of his followers were the wrong way to go. They were the ones dragging them in front of the courts. They were the ones trying to keep them down. They were the ones trying to hold the church back. And so why on earth would you honor or esteem or try to suck up to the people, the very ones who are calling your king, your Lord, Jesus Christ, um, calling for his and his believers persecution? Why would you want to do that? Why would you want to align yourselves with the people who really seek to persecute and condemn you. And that's what's wrong with favoritism, among other things. It plays into a world's way of seeing things rather than a kingdom way of seeing things. It causes you to focus on your own insecurities, which is not something believers should be thinking about. And favoritism tends to not benefit the church, but rather to benefit those who seek to persecute the church. And so James pretty clearly condemns this notion of favoritism. Now, to be clear, here's a question we're probably all asking us. Isn't this passage really just about the rich, right? I mean, the passage goes on about how it's the rich people who are persecuting. And it's the rich people who think that they're fancy. And it's money that causes us to be to, to worship materialism and idolatry and all these kinds of things that, the, that God warns us about that are not uh, kingdom ways of understanding or interpreting or living, up, living in the world. Isn't this all about money or about those who have money? And the answer to that is no. Okay, not even in this passage, the, many other places in scripture, and we've talked about this many times, there are people that God very deliberately blesses with wealth, okay? And if God is blessing someone with wealth, 
it is by definition not a bad thing in itself to be wealthy. So that's not the point. The point isn't that rich people or being rich or being wealthy or having a lot or even appearing um, well presented is always bad. That's not the point. The point is that the church has to have the right perspective and not be obsessed with the world's way of seeing things. And whatever it is that's causing the world to be obsessed or to idolize or to put into this position of status that we want to aspire to or be close to or be like, that is not what we're supposed to be letting guide our decisions. In this passage, it was the wealthy who were persecuting the church. But that might not be what it is today. Whatever the signal of the day might be, we as the church are supposed to stick to kingdom principles. So here's my question for you. What is trending today? If James were to write this passage today, would he say, don't walk the rich to the front and give them the VIP? Well, he would probably say that because there's certainly that certainly some of that still goes on. We still idolize celebrity and wealth in our culture for sure. But there are other things, many other things that are now the signal of status and importance and worldliness, right? What people aspire to that we will idolize that we would give the VIP slot if this were written today. So what's popular today? And how are we as the church and how are we as individuals playing into that at the expense of the true gospel message? And that's why the title of this passage is uh, Status Signaling is Bad. It's favoritism. It's not good for us. It's ungodly, it's sinful according to this scripture, but so too is what I'm calling virtue signaling. Now that might touch a nerve with some people because virtue signaling may have different connotations for you, but I challenge you that when you do something that plays into the world's paradigm and plays into your insecurities and tends to idolize or elevate things of the world, rather than, and especially things of the world that have a disdain for the church or that stand against the church, then you're falling victim to the same trap or you're making yourself guilty of the same issue that James was pointing out about specifically rich people getting the VIP slot in the church in his day. It's okay that we do things that are good. We should do things that are good and that demonstrate our commitment to God and to our faith and to the things that God tells us to do. But if we are doing them for the sake of puffing ourselves up or making ourselves look important because we want to play into what the world says has decided for today is important, then we're making the same mistake that James is talking about the church was making with favoritism. So the virtue signaling culture, where we all walk around doing things that other people think are good, or we walk around trying to be friends with or associated with people that other people that the world thinks, world idolizes, right? Even if they're good things in themselves on some level, when we're doing it with the idea in mind that this is what I need to do to make myself look as virtuous or as great as these people. We're getting into the same trap. We're doing the same thing. We're in the same realm of sinfulness that James is talking about. Now, I'm not trying to discourage you from doing good things, right? But I am trying to encourage you that when you do good things, make sure you're doing them because it's what God has told us is good what God has commanded us to do, and not because that's the popular thing to do today. It may coincidentally be a popular thing to do, but what if tomorrow that changes? 
What if tomorrow society, culture, the cool crowd tells us that something that was cool today is no longer cool? And coincidentally, it's something that God tells us we should be doing. What happens when the world changes its mind? Well, if you were doing it because God told you to do it and not because the world told you to do it, it won't change anything about the way you live your life. You will still treat people the same. You will still interact with people the same. You will still stand for the same principles and values. But if you were doing it, not because it's what God said is good for us to do, but because the world happened to esteem it at the moment, and what a fringe benefit that God also happens to like it, then you'll be afraid to keep doing it because you'll lose your status. You'll lose your associations. You'll lose your popularity. And then you'll be no different from those that James talked about way in the beginning that are tossed about like a wave where you have no foundation, rather you follow whatever way the wind chooses to blow you around and you have no, you have no way of stopping it and you have no way of standing against it. So what is the true message, right? What, what if we're trying to avoid doing things just because they're popular today, and their status symbols today, or their virtue signals today, but rather we want to do things that really line up with God's message of how his people are supposed to behave themselves and interact with one another. What does this passage tell us about what that looks like? Well, it goes on after it gives the little description of don't show favoritism. Don't tell the poor guy to sit on the floor while you tell the rich guy, you usher the rich guy up to the best seat in the house. It then goes on to talk about the law. It's very interesting. And it says those who follow the law, okay, recognize that the law in its entirety has to be followed. And once you break even one part of it, you're guilty of breaking the whole thing. And then it goes into this discussion about judgment versus mercy. So let's unpack that and see how does that relate to favoritism? Well, first of all, the law is complete, okay? So the main point it's making here about the law is that when you break one piece, you break the whole thing. And if you think about it, this it's been described many ways before, but one of the best pictures is think of a glass. Once a glass is broken, it's broken. It doesn't matter that it's only, only a little bit broken, right? It's still a broken piece of glass. My windshield currently has a crack that goes all the way across, uh, all the way across the windshield. And it started as a little crack, but as it always does, inevitably, it, it, the crack continued to spread until it had worked its way all the way across uh, the bottom of the windshield. And the whole thing is going to need to be replaced. I just haven't gotten around to doing it. But once the crack was in the glass, once, once it began to spread there, I can no longer say that it's a piece of intact glass. It's a piece of broken glass. It is a cracked windshield and it will never be uncracked. Just likewise, if you get a flat tire, it doesn't matter that it starts a little bit flat and then it continues until you're riding on your rim. It's a flat tire is a flat tire and it doesn't get unflat unless you fix it or replace it right? The law is like that. Once you break one piece of the law, you are guilty of violating the law as a whole. And then it goes on to say something interesting. And it says a person who obeys the commandment or lives up to the commandment or tries to adhere to the commandment of love your neighbor as yourself, but then goes on to show favoritism is in sin. That person is breaking the law. So think about that. A person who understands that we should love one another and love our neighbors, but shows favoritism, even in the way that James describes here, the kind of favoritism that just says, you look important, I'll give you the, the best seat in the house, right? Something that on some level, metaphorically, we're all guilty of doing. Even though the rest of the time you love your neighbor, as the law commands, you're guilty of breaking the whole law. And then it's interesting because it goes on to say the same 
the same author of do not commit adultery also said do not commit murder. So a person who manages not to commit adultery, but then commits murder is guilty of breaking the whole law. And they're not off the hook because they adhered to one if they didn't adhere to the other. Now, most of us would think of that just the opposite way. Isn't the, wor isn't the, isn't the, the graver sin the murder and not the adultery? But the point of this passage is, and we would say the same thing about loving your neighbor, right? Isn't it the graver sin to not love your neighbor rather than showing favoritism? But that's the point of this passage. To adhere to the law is to adhere to all of it. And even if you adhere to the best parts of it or what you consider to be the most important parts of it, but you break some of the maybe not so important parts of it, according to you, you're still guilty of breaking all of it. And by the way, what you think are the most important parts may not in God's eyes, in fact, be the most important parts. He might value some things a lot more than you think he does. And you should not apply your judgment and interpretation as to which parts of the law you think are okay to sort of maybe, maybe they're strong suggestions rather than total mandates. I'll adhere to the really important stuff, but I'll give myself a break on the not so important stuff. And by the way, I'll decide what's the not so important stuff. This scripture is telling us don't do that. But it's also acknowledging we all do that. And don't we do that? We all know we're sinners, right? All of us. I don't think anyone on this meeting today would say that they're not a sinner. But all of us would probably say, even though we are sinners, we don't do the really bad sins, right? We don't do the really bad stuff. We don't commit murder. We don't, let's say we don't commit adultery. We don't steal. We don't, um, maybe we don't tell really bad lies. We're, we're mostly honest people. You know, maybe we steward our time and our finances and our gifts and other resources pretty well, but, you know, not so well. Maybe we're kind to people most of the time, except for when they really, really deserve it. And then we get a little bit angry and harsh and, and um, vengeful with them. Maybe we only do that once in a while. Maybe we only do that with one or two people who, who really push our buttons. But, but, but everyone else we love with the love of the Lord, right? Don't we carve out this sort of tiered system? for ourselves and, and follow kind of this odd sense of justice that we've conjured up that makes it okay for us to live our lives, you know, just on this side of salvation, but with a whole lot of grace for the rest of the stuff that, that, that we know we're going to get wrong well because we're all sinful. This passage is saying that kind of mentality is as silly as saying it's okay for me to murder as long as I don't cheat on my spouse, which none of us think would think makes any sense. But it's as hypocritical to live the way that we do as it would be for the person to live the way that is described in this passage. So what do we do about it? Well, the first thing we do was we understand the true standard. The true standard is that the law is the law. And if you break one little piece of it, even one little piece, you're guilty of breaking the whole thing. Once you've broken the glass, it cannot be unbroken. And when we recognize that that is the standard, then it becomes very clear to us that we are in desperate, desperate need of mercy and a mercy that we are incapable of offering to ourselves. We are incapable of unbreaking ourselves. We have to be totally remade and replaced. Only the spirit of God and salvation in Jesus Christ can repair what we have broken. And when we know that that's the state that we're in, when we truly have an honest moment and we recognize that's that's where we are, no matter how 
wonderfully we thought of ourselves before, no matter how much we thought, well, we sort of make the mark, but we miss it a little bit. And that's okay, because there's grace. When we really wrap our mind around where we stand, it's very easy to understand how desperately we need mercy. And once we recognize how desperately we need mercy, it's a lot easier to recognize that others need it as well. In the justice system of God, both judgment and mercy are required. Judgment and mercy are required. And the scripture tells us that those that deal with others with judgment and no mercy will be treated, will be evaluated, will be judged by the real judge, by God, by that same standard. Now, again, this doesn't mean that there's no such thing as right and wrong. This doesn't mean that we can never point out to someone or disagree with someone where they've done things that we think are wrong to us or against God or whatever. It doesn't mean we can't have opinions about people's behaviors. There is a judgment aspect. There is a right and wrong, but there is also a mercy aspect. And when you judge without mercy, you have asked God to apply the same standard to you. And this silly little notion of showing favoritism, what we might think is silly as showing favoritism, as ushering the person who looks fancy to the nicest seat in the house, to the VIP section, makes us as guilty of violating the law as someone who doesn't follow the main commandment, right? That Jesus said, how do you sum up all the commandments? Love the Lord your God and love others, right? I mean, that's pretty important. Even Jesus said you could sum up all the other, the law um, in, in this summary. And yet James is saying, you could live out this notion of loving your neighbor as yourself. But if you show favoritism, you're breaking, you're breaking the law and you're as guilty as the person who commits adultery or murder. Guilty for different reasons, guilty in different ways, having different consequences for those behavior. I'm not equating those things, but I am putting them all into the bucket of we've broken the law. We have broken the glass and only Jesus can unbreak it. Judgment and mercy are required. And when we recognize that God gives us, grants us both judgment and mercy, then we are able to grant that to others. And then it goes on to say, speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. The law that gives freedom. Now, remember last week when we talked about this, we tend to think of a law as something that binds us up, that restricts us, that tells us what we can't do. We don't tend to think of it as something that gives us freedom and liberty and this passage is reminding us again that it does. The law of God is the only kind of law that gives us boundaries, but the kind of boundaries that enable us to live our lives without the grave consequence of sin. When we deviate outside of those boundaries, we get into territory that will cause destruction and death in our lives and in the lives of other people. And that's not freedom. That's destruction and death. That's the opposite of freedom. The opposite of being free isn't just being enslaved, right? That, that's not free either. But the complete and permanent opposite of freedom is death. Because you have no control over anything because you cease to exist. But when we live within the law, when we choose to submit ourselves to the boundaries that God gives us, then we can experience what it truly is to be free. And God's law is the only law, it's called the perfect law, right? As we discussed, because only God perfectly knows the way we ought to be. And he knows because he created us. So we have the one who created us that gives us boundaries. And we don't like those boundaries because sometimes they contradict with what we'd like to do. But the scriptures warn us that what we would like to do 
will often take us to a place that leads to death. We will be slaves to our sin and the ultimate consequence of living according to our sinfulness is death, spiritual death and separation from God. But if we would voluntarily restrict ourselves to the boundaries, the perfect boundaries that God gave us, even when they're uncomfortable, even when they contradict our feelings or our preferences, even when they go against what society says is important and good and valuable and worth having, or idolizing, even when they contradict that, if we stay within the bounds that God has given us, then we will realize true, true freedom. So somebody's letting me know that it's hard to hear me again. Um, I honestly don't know what's the problem. The only thing I can think of is that my microphone is malfunctioning. I use a microphone I use a microphone so that I don't have to speak into the computer's mic and maybe it's not working anymore. Heather, I hear you just fine, honey. Okay. I okay. hear you just fine too. This is okay, Julie. okay, great, great, great. Thank you. All right, well, I'm gonna also, I'm gonna take a look at the microphone before next week. It's, it's, it's just a little cheapy thing, but it's served the purpose so far, but maybe not anymore. Um, all right, so we want to, according to James, as we tie all this up, as we wrap this up, we want to speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. What's this telling us to do? Well, first, what does this mean about sinning? Is it okay to sin? If we know that we have mercy as well as judgment, obviously no, <laughs> okay? The Bible makes this very, very, very clear elsewhere and in this passage as well. Paul says, because grace abounds, does that mean, because grace abounds more in areas where there's more sin, does that mean we should sin even more, right? If the greater our sin, the greater the grace, doesn't it stand to reason then that we should just sin as much as we can because who wouldn't want more grace? And you get more grace when you get more sins. And then he says, no, that's ridiculous. Don't be silly. We are still supposed to live according to the law, but we have to recognize that God in his mercy has offered us grace. Well, what are we supposed to do? Obviously, recognize favoritism is sin. We talked about that. It seems like a small one, but the reason it's chosen is because it's a small sin with very deep roots. We don't show favoritism just because it's the, it's the polite thing to do. The polite thing to do, the hosp hospitable thing to do, the gracious thing to do is when a guest comes to your house, you treat them like a guest. You roll out the red carpet, you do nice things. Maybe you take out your linens and your china and your whatever you do. But you want to do that because they're your guest, because it honors them. You wouldn't do that if you had two guests coming to dinner and one got to sit at a fancy spot with the fancy china and the other one you gave a paper plate, unless they're kids. <laughs> kids should get the paper plates. But you get my point. If you had invited two people over for dinner and one showed up and they looked very fancy and the other showed up and they, they wore their sweats, something I tend to do, and you made the one sit you know, and eat out of his lap with a paper plate and the other one you gave the head of the table, we all recognize that would be ridiculous. That would not be gracious or hospitable. So favoritism isn't that you should never do nice or hospitable things or roll out the red carpet for someone. Favoritism is you shouldn't do it because of someone's status or because you want to signal your own virtues or because you are idolizing what the world idolizes and you shouldn't behave and act according to principles, values and whatnot that adhere to the world rather than those that adhere to the kingdom. So when you show favoritism in this way that James is describing what you are doing is you are committing what we might call a relatively small or minor sin but that has very deep roots. Those roots being you value the world above the things of God. You're playing into your insecurities and you're tending to benefit things and people that don't value the church. And in fact, may even stand against the church so that you can look virtuous and worthy of high status. So favoritism is an example of a small action with deep roots. And when we commit those kinds of behaviors, 
we are as guilty as the next sinner. And when we put all of that into perspective, then we recognize our desperate need for mercy. And we can share that mercy with others. It becomes easier to share the mercy that we know we need to offer that to others. And it helps us to have a correct point of view or perspective on the law. When this passage tells us to act, speak and act like one who will be judged according to the law that gives freedom. It's telling us to do all the things that we've talked about in unpacking this passage, but it's also reminding us that the gospel message, the law of God, following God and surrendering to Jesus gives freedom. And that is so opposite of what the world tells us being a believer is like. And we as believers ought to be on the front lines as loud as we can to anyone who will listen, exclaiming that true freedom is found in Jesus Christ. We talked about this a bit last week, and we had to carry it over into today because this is such a crucial point, and it's a place that so many people miss. So many people reject God because they are afraid of what it will do to their lives. They are afraid of how it will bind them up. And there's not a whole lot we can do about that fear because we get it. We get it. We were there at one point too. But what, where we should be today is the place where we say, no, 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 you've got it backwards. That is a lie from hell. Following God, surrendering, surrendering to God isn't about binding you up. It is about setting you free and truly setting you free. Not just free to be who God made you to be, like we talked about last week, but free to experience your existence in its fullness, free to have everything that humanity, that being a human being, that being a person created in the image of God with his likeness is free to have, to be, to experience. And it is truly, truly an exciting thing. So our homework for this week is how can you speak and act even more like one who's going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. What do you have to do differently? Do you need to recognize that you've set up a system of justice for yourself that gives you permission to do little things that you know are wrong, but you know they're not as wrong as they could be. And they're not wrong all the time. And they're only wrong with certain people who really push your buttons, right? Or when you really feel justified. Maybe you need to reassess that and take that to God. Maybe you need to reassess how you see the law altogether. Maybe you are still in that place where you worry a little bit about surrendering to God because you're scared about what it might do to you. What is God going to shake up in your life if you fully turn yourself over to him? And maybe that, that worries you. And you need to talk to God about having a better perspective on his law and on his boundaries. Or maybe you're one who seeks to status or virtue signal. And not because, God, not because we're doing things that God said is good for us to do, but because it's what the world tells us today is important. And you know that if the world changed, changed its mind tomorrow, so would you. Maybe that's a conversation you need to have with God. But how can we take the instruction of this passage that we are to speak and act like one who's going to be judged by the law that gives freedom and make that come alive even more in our lives. All right, let's pray. Lord, we thank you again for this time together this morning. We thank you for fellowship, for the body of Christ. And moreover, Lord, we thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit that teaches us, that challenges us, that encourages us and counsels us. And we pray, God, that as we've each heard maybe a little something this morning that's, that's, that's struck a nerve or that's caused us to think or see things a little bit differently or a little more deeply, we pray, God, that you will, that you will grow those seeds in our lives, that they will bear fruit, that we will be able to see the fruit, experience it, and that it will cause us to draw even closer, even deeper, even more into you. We want to be excited about our relationship with you, Lord. 
And we want to be so excited and so committed that whatever the cost, we lay ourselves down and we pick up instead the beautiful law that gives us freedom. We pray that you will give us the inspiration and the courage to do so. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So my apologies.